adversarial machine learning. It's basically how do we secure all of these technologies? How do we account for all of these different kinds of attacks? Because unlike a traditional system, machine learning can be more complicated, right? <laughs> Sometimes people don't fully understand the machine learning algorithm and how it works, mm -hmm. but then that gives yeah. the adversary an opportunity to basically attack it, right? So mm -hmm. that's really what adversarial machine learning is doing. Welcome to the Elephant and AppSec, the podcast to explore, challenge, and boldly face the AppSec elephants in the room. I'm Alexandra, your host, joined by my amazing co-host Tristan, a former security engineer and co-founder of Escape. Today, we're excited to have an amazing guest, Anmol Agarwal, join us. Anmol is a security researcher at Nokia, focused on securing AI and machine learning in 6G and 5G. She also holds a doctoral degree in cybersecurity analytics from George Washington University. Her research was focused on adversarial machine learning and federated learning. Amol is also an active speaker and spoken at various conferences, including Secure World, Pacific Hackers Conference, and others. In her free time, she enjoys giving back to the community as an active industry mentor for women in cybersecurity. As you can see, Anmol is a true expert in adversarial machine learning, so we have decided to challenge her on its current state and how she sees its evolution in the future. Dive right in! Hi Anmol, so I'm very, very excited to have you today on our podcast. I think it's uh, great that we have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, and it's actually very exciting for us to talk with someone with a security research background, because it's something that we really value on uh, our side and I think it, it would be great you know to bring uh, your expertise uh, into the podcast and share it with our listeners and uh, I know you're starting also your speaking <laughs> journey uh, right now so I've seen uh, you're going to attend a panel for like data science uh, a conference in Austin in March, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, like the key trends in AI and the machine learning, which is your expert field of expertise, you know, in uh, especially in this year in 2024, it's kind of a big topic. And we've seen, you know, since the last year with like explosion of ChatGPT, the exponential rise in uh, AI and uh, ML technologies. So I think the question that I have for you is to someone like the big, ex large expertise in the field, like what are actually like key trends that you've seen so far? Yeah, so I actually think generative AI, it's a big trend right now. There's a lot of hype around it. You know, yeah. chat GPT, everyone yeah. thinks AI equals generative AI equals something like chat GPT with these large language models. Um, that's not the only thing that AI is, but that's definitely one of the trends we're seeing. And then I think the other trend would be with the metaverse. So actually, in my line of work, we're looking at the metaverse and looking at using AI in the metaverse. For those who are not aware, metaverse is like a virtual reality we communicate via avatars instead of as real people. You know, it's avatar based. Um, so also with the metaverse, there are many different tasks that you could do, like not just virtual reality, but maybe you have other apps running and you want to use AI for that. And then another trend is digital twins. So I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but for those in the audience, digital twins, think of it, it's a twin, right? So it's a digital copy of something that exists in the real world. So an example of this would be, let's say, you know, um, critical infrastructure. <laughs> you know, we have some kind of critical, critical infrastructure system, something there. Uh, and we could create a digital twin. So basically a digital copy of this yeah. system, device, whatever. And we're creating this digital copy even though it's a digital copy, it is getting data from the real system. And then all of this data is being used to basically simulate what this system is so that if we were to, let's say, attack it, mm -hmm. we can attack the digital twin and mm -hmm. see what would the system do if it is attacked in some way? How would it respond? Yeah. And sometimes you use AR for that. 
because you need AI to analyze all of this data. So I think those are the trends that stand out. Okay, very interesting. And uh, for example, for Metaverse, how much time do you spend uh, there <laughs> per week? Yeah, so um, my role is kind of research and development. So I'm working on like six or 10 different things. Metaverse <laughs> is just one thing. Um, right now, Metaverse is still in the early stages. So if you've heard of 6G, so 6G, 5G is out right now. 6G will come in 2030 is the prediction. Okay. So we're working on 6G to enable the metaverse, basically. Okay. So looking at the different security vulnerabilities that could exist with that technology. And uh, if we, I don't know if you, you've seen, but probably that like uh, Apple released the, the Vision Pro like uh, headset, oh, yeah. like virtual reality <laughs> headset. So it, it feels crazy to me because I see those videos of people with their headset, like walking in the streets, like especially in New York City. And I mean, it, it feels crazy to me. Like what happens if they get hacked? Like if they get compromised and you can just start like making people, you know, like have hallucinations or or like uh, get actually the data that what they see from their eyes. So it sounds crazy to me. Like, uh, is it something that you see as a trend, like tr starting to try to exploit uh, those uh, uh, virtual reality um, headsets and technologies? Yeah, I think with cybersecurity, anything in security, we know adversaries, they're going to find a yeah. way to attack something, <laughs> right? No yeah. matter whether it's metaverse or virtual yeah. headsets. And I'm sure we're going to see something in the news and they'll say this virtual headset was attacked. I think I'm really concerned because we don't want someone to walk into traffic or fall off of a building, right? You don't want anything like that. So yeah. it's important to safeguard this technology, but it's very challenging. How do you go about that? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And it's very exciting and very scary at the same time, to be honest. Right. Yeah, but I think it's also like security approach to start thinking about these things when you hear about, you know, hardware or like new hyped hardware or software, because I spent like uh, for the last week of watching a lot of videos about uh, the, the headset. And uh, I think it's actually, I don't still don't have this reflection so far. So it's very interesting, like to, to see different uh, kind of facets of it as well. And uh, like, on your side, since your like background of in machine learning, like how do you see you know the rise of uh, this adversaries and adversarial like, machine learning influencing these trends? Yeah, so adversarial machine learning will impact all of these trends. We talked about security, right? So adversarial mm -hmm. machine learning, it's basically how do we secure all of these technologies? How do we account for all of these different kinds of attacks? Because unlike a traditional system, machine learning can be more complicated, right? Sometimes people don't fully understand the machine learning algorithm and how it works. Mm -hmm. But then that gives yeah. the adversary an opportunity to basically attack it, right? So mm -hmm. that's really what adversarial machine learning is doing. Okay. And uh, if, you know, we have very different level of uh, you know level of people in the audience so for people who might you know not un really understand what it is like can you explain a little bit what is what is it actually yeah so if you were to look up right now what is adversarial machine learning you'll probably see a definition like this it's the study of attacks and defenses against machine learning attacks, basically. So it's studying attacks as well as defenses on machine learning models. So what does this actually mean, right? So let's take attack scenarios. One attack scenario is a data poisoning attack. So it, it kind of sounds very easy to understand. If you just think of the words data poisoning, poisoning data, right? So Let's go back to the digital twin example. You could perform a data poisoning attack on this digital twin and basically inject bad data into the system. And so maybe, you know, the system is offline in real life, but then you could say your digital twin is online by injecting this false data. So that's mm -hmm. data poisoning, right? So. Mm -hmm. In an extreme example, this could basically be used to attack the machine learning model. So 
it's not functioning as it's designed to do. Um, another example of attack, which we would be very interested in in a security field is something called membership inference attack. Okay. So basically what this means is we are trying to infer what the members are of our data sets. Mm -hmm. So for those in the audience who don't know machine learning, machine learning, just think of it as an algorithm. We have input data, output data, and some kind of algorithm. This algorithm determines how the input data and the output data relate to each other. Training data and test data. Training is input, test is output. So in data poisoning, we're changing this training data that the machine learning model is using. So let's say digital twin, we train the model on incorrect information. Then it will basically output incorrect predictions. It basically gives you incorrect results because you don't know what's happening, right? But then also with membership inference, that attack, what you can do is say that I query the model. Let's change our example. Let's say our machine learning model is recognizing street signs. Mm -hmm. um, so I can query the model and I can say, okay, what is, what am I seeing here? Is this a stop sign, a speed limit sign? So it can tell me, okay, I see a speed limit sign, for example. So you can actually query the model like this. It gives you answers, right? So then mm -hmm. membership inference, what it's doing is Basically, you can infer that all these members in the training data set were used to basically develop the machine learning model. So if I were to take pictures of street signs here in the US and take pictures of street signs in France, maybe my model can only recognize street signs in New York. It cannot recognize yeah. street signs in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I could infer that street signs in New York means that my model was trained in the New York. Mm. So then that's how okay. membership inference works, right? So mm -hmm. that's really what it's doing. Now, if we were to apply this to a business scenario, what it's doing is it's saying that, let's say we have customer data. If you can infer any of this customer data from a commercial application, then, I mean, that's a privacy breach. You can get mm -hmm. all their information. Maybe in a hospital setting, you could get patient information yeah. so we don't want that to happen yeah yeah, yeah. this is uh, uh so so it means basically an attack where you attempt to like rebuild the training data by yeah. interacting with the model right and right. and actually i think this have happened like even to open ia very recently uh where the new york times i think it's the new york times like, they were able to to, to prove that somehow chat gpt has been trained with some of their articles because they were able to build back like full New York Times articles by sending specific input to ChatGPT on specific topics. Yeah, I mean, I saw an article that people are saying they can find out whether their code was used and trained yeah. with ChatGPT. Oh, that's and crazy. so, you know, that's also a privacy violation. <laughs> your your <laughs> sensitive code can be seen for yeah. the whole world. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah 100%. And, um, uh, and are there other kinds? So we have you've mentioned like a data poisoning. So like yeah. creating data that is aimed at uh, breaking the model or making it, making it like biased, right. for instance. Uh, there is also trying to like infer the data that was used for training. And is there another kind of uh, yes, adversarial I'm, attacks? There are many many kinds. Mm -hmm. um, I think one other notable example that the audience might be interested in. It's called evasion. Mm -hmm. So if you were to Google or search for adversarial machine learning, you might see a picture and it will have a panda on it and it says panda and it goes to given. Yeah, I think you know this example, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're basically adding noise to the image. So you're saying this panda, it, it's a given because the model thinks the panda is a yeah. given because noise is added to the image. So and that's an example of an adversarial um, e example. That's what mm -hmm. is called, adversarial example. And it basically means that we change images in a way that as humans, we can see it's a panda, but then as a machine learning model, it can't see that this is a panda. It thinks it's still 
Yeah. You know, it's it's a gibbon. It's not a panda because this noise has been added to the image. So an example for maybe real world scenario that they talk about a lot in research is against stop sign, speed limit sign. You could maybe trick the model and think a stop sign is a speed limit sign because you add the noise and it confuses yeah. mm -hmm. the model. Yeah, and you create yeah. a, a big crash, right? Like a big right. car crash. Yeah. yeah, that that's super scary to be honest. And right. when you when you when you have like a a, a self driving vehicle, mm. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm a machine learning engineer originally, <laughs> uh, before before I started working in business. Um, and when I take like I, I enter like a self driving vehicle, I'm al always worried about that. Like machine learning models are so biased and so like. Yes dedicated mm. to their training data that if, you, if they go a bit outside of the training set, they're completely lost, like fully lost. Yeah. It's crazy. That's why like in the city, it's so hard to drive these self-driving cars because you yeah. never know what's going to happen. But it's really good with highways, right? Where it's predictable route, no unexpected changes. But yes, it's very scary in the city. Mm. And uh, I've seen also, I, I think it's a joke more than like a real life example, but um, there is like a, a picture on the internet with a car and instead of the license plate, there is like a, a big text with an SQL injection uh, instead of the license plate. Uh, so the idea is like, there is like a, a machine learning algorithm that will parse the text on the speed cameras when they see the car speeding and they will actually get like an SQL instruction to drop the database. And so everybody that would have had a speed ticket, like they would be saved by the injection. So I believe it's more like a joke than an actual example. I mean, I hope so. Uh, but you, hope you so. never know. You never know. Yeah. Um, you never know. And, and my question is, in, in real life, have you ever like, noticed real life example of successful um, uh, cyber attacks uh, and, and successful adversarial uh, attacks on machine learning algorithm? Yeah, I mean, so I think everyone probably knows about the Tay chatbot, so that's one example. So for those who are not familiar with it, it's basically Microsoft deployed a chatbot to Twitter and to other social media apps back in 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. And basically, the bot had to be taken out of operation within 24 to 48 hours because what they were doing was they were training on just tweets like raw Twitter data that anyone could send Tay a message. Imagine what happens if you put something like that on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to put obviously fake information and then mm -hmm. the chat bot will just give the information it learns yeah. back to you. So that's why they had to shut that down. Um, also in research, something that people might find interesting is the self-driving car example. Mm -hmm. So there have actually been attacks on the Tesla autopilot performed by mm -hmm. security yeah. researchers. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they presented this at Black Hat. So you can add noise to the autopilot camera. So it thinks that it's raining when it's actually not raining um, because when you add noise to it, it looks like grainy image it might be raining and then it's basically going to start the wipers even though it's not raining outside mm. so that's one example okay and in the industry do you know if there are any way like people are developing any frameworks so you know or standards to act on the security side to actually pre pre prevent you know these attacks i think that's still a work in progress you know, people are talking about AI governance a lot now, but it's still a work in progress. The challenge with all of these adversarial machine learning attacks is it's very difficult to standardize this kind of mm. framework. So one one resource is from MITRE uh, and Microsoft and I think other authors. They wrote this tool, it's called Atlas. So if you're aware of MITRE attack, those in the security field are probably aware of MITRE attack. Basically, um, the tactics and techniques that are used to carry out any cyber attack, right? So you can extend that to adversarial machine learning and use that to trace the different steps of the adversarial machine learning attack. Mm -hmm. And then basically as an analyst, say that, okay, I was attacked, so what happened? 
and then try to mitigate those kinds of attacks. Um, but also in the US, they are working on different uh, risk management frameworks for mm -hmm. AI. So in the US, there's a standardization body NIST. So I know they're working on yeah. something, but it's it's still very much in the early stages. Yeah, and I think OWASP as well is developing uh, this framework for the for they AI. Have, the yeah, and OWASP a uh, top ten for adversarial machine learning. They they, they better do. <laughs> they better do because like <laughs> everyone will have machine learning models in all the tools ever. So yeah, of course. Um, great. And and um, so you're a member of a special uh, team uh, in your in your research. You're working on another topic that is not directly linked uh, to machine learning, uh, but it also tied to uh, like uh, telecommunications, like uh, 5G and 6G, right? Right. So I work um, as a security researcher and I'm specifically working with security standardization for mm -hmm. telecommunications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's why part of that is machine learning security, but okay. also in telecommunications, people don't, sometimes they don't understand, but telecommunications is very important. Like the fact we can even have this call, yeah, it's because of telecommunications, right? So yeah. to actually standardize all of this technology, it takes up to 10 years. It's a really long mm. effort. Mm. And there are many different standardization bodies that are global. I mean, in Europe, you have Etsy, if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also one initiative I'm involved in, which is 3GPP, which yeah. is the yeah. third generation partnership project. Okay. If mm -hmm. the audience were to just look up 3GPP, <laughs> we'll put the see... link uh, below. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you you will see basically a lot of different working groups and a lot of different files. And if you were to click on one of the links, it will give you like a zip folder. And then the documents will be like 100, 500 pages of standard documents. So in my role, I'm specifically working on a security team. So there's one special working group for security standards within that. Okay, we're super interesting. Like, how long does it take to be to come to the consensus? You know, like, or how actually, how often do you meet with these people? <laughs> So I can I can explain the process at a very mm. high level. Yeah. So I'm research and development, but there's another counterpart on my team. They're basically called delegates. So the mm. delegates are the ones they meet. Um, right now, 6G is not started because we're researching and developing it right now. But 5G advanced has started or that is starting. So you've heard of 5G, 5G advanced is basically 5G 2.0, version 2.0. And with that process, it can take multiple years. So one cycle is basically one year and the delegates meet six times a year all over the world. So this is not just US, it's Europe. You know, we had some meetings in Athens, we have some meetings in Paris, we have some meetings in Finland, we have some meetings in China, so all over the world. And all of these companies, they meet to discuss how to standardize the technology. So it's not just one company, it's all of these companies all over the world. So not only AT&T, Ericsson, Nokia, but also mm -hmm. Apple, Samsung, Huawei, mm -hmm. all of these companies hundreds of them, they meet to discuss how do we okay. standardize this technology? What should we do for all the different aspects? Super interesting. So when next time when you're in Paris, uh, you should come and say hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> happy to meet you. So uh, great. And uh, so outside of the, like actually in general, what would you recommend for the organizations, you know, who want to protect themselves? Uh, from uh, machine learning attacks, what would you recommend for them to do? I think there are two sides to machine learning attacks. So really, we really focused on machine learning being the one that is attacked as in the victim. So in that case, if you're trying to protect your own machine learning algorithms and models, I think 
a lot of the cybersecurity fundamentals still apply. You know, confidentiality, mm -hmm. integrity, and availability, and mm -hmm. secure by design. So don't just throw machine learning onto a solution if you don't know how it works and you need to make mm -hmm. sure you can secure it, right? And then also with adversarial machine learning, you need to make sure that there are security measures for your model, for your data, as well as the communications between your model and your data. So in cybersecurity, we typically talk about data encrypted at rest and in transit. And this still applies with machine learning. You need to make sure you encrypt your data when it is stored in the database, as well as when it's being communicated outside, because you don't want something like membership inference attack to occur very easily. And um, the, the precise link between 6G and machine learning IA ML attacks, like, I mean, for instance, do you, like, have you, do you have some research about like using machine learning for attacking 6G like or or even 5G networks for instance is it something that is also in the scope of your research or is it really machine learning as a target of cyber attacks and not as a tool for performing cyber attacks on other systems Yeah I mean in my role we're doing both so mm -hmm. right now on this show, I can't really disclose what exactly we're working on <laughs> because just to give the audience background, anytime we create a solution, it's basically a patent. Yes. So mm -hmm. we don't want to disclose patents, but basically imagine all of these people are working on these different patents and different ideas mm -hmm. to not only secure machine learning, but also see can any threat vectors exist within 5G and 6G. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at all these different scenarios. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, that's super interesting, super exciting topic. Uh, I mean, it's, of course, everything is patented, so we cannot discuss that today. <laughs> uh, but I hope that there will be like more, uh, uh, I mean, the community on the community side, it's pretty active as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So there might be more and more open source projects related to this kind of topics. Uh, and uh, this is a very exciting field to be in. Yeah, maybe in like five to ten years, I could come back and we can discuss it then. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <Pleasure>. <laughs> of course, whenever you want. But again, like uh, as Alexandra said, we have many, we do many events about cybersecurity here in Paris okay. as well. Uh, so if for a reason you you come to 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 France for uh, for the business, we'll be happy to host you um, for for a cybersecurity event and discuss that. Um, great and. Um, for do you have like an advice so we we ask something very often like to to the, the the guests of the podcast like do you have an advice for young people wanting to get into cyber security times machine learning uh like a career or want to to work in these fields you know like where to start like do you start from a cyber security background or from a machine learning background how do you learn where do you go Mm -hmm. I'm super, I'm sure that in origins, many people would be interested by having insight about that. Yeah, so I kind of do both machine learning and cybersecurity. Mm. So right now I'm teaching a machine learning course, but I graduated with my doctoral degree in cybersecurity analytics. Okay. But for your, for actually doing this kind of thing, you need to take both classes. You need to take machine learning and you need to take cybersecurity because mm -hmm. I think in the industry, we still have this gap of knowledge where people really know AI and machine learning, and then they don't know cybersecurity or the opposite problem. Yeah. People know cybersecurity and they don't know machine learning. So how do we bridge that gap? Well, you have to do both. But if a younger person is interested, I think my advice is to just read up as much as you can. You know, machine learning, start with Python start with just watching tutorials about machine learning, how it works with Python, because even in cybersecurity, we use Python. So Python is a really good programming language to start with. And then for cybersecurity, again, just reading and maybe getting involved with meetups and just networking with people across data science and machine learning. And uh, how did you decide actually to get, you know, a doctoral degree? Because it's very, you know, high level, like a very, you know, actually in-depth level knowledge. 
think that's what we're looking like. If very depth, why did you decide uh, to go so much in depth for this topic? Yeah, so um, it's a long story in terms of why I decided to get a doctoral degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I never thought I would get a doctoral degree, to be honest. <laughs> it just kind of happened. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I was not expecting that at all as an answer. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of happened. But okay, so what happened was I studied computer science, and then I really like cybersecurity. Um, I was involved with WESIS, which is Women in Cybersecurity. And my mentor at the time really recommended getting a doctoral degree. Okay. And she said, you should get a doctoral degree to get promoted later in your career. And while you're young, you should do it. And so then I took her advice and decided to do a doctoral degree. But okay. was I planning for it? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I mean, the advice actually makes sense because I got a lot of uh, this advice when I studied uh, engineering back then. So I doubt it <laughs> a lot, uh, but I think it's yeah, a big engagement in terms of uh, time like three years sometimes uh, even more so it takes a really like a lot of dedication you know to the spe- very specific topic because what was uh, your dissertation about yes it was about adversarial machine learning <laughs> which is what we're talking about um so i did a doctoral degree part-time while i was working mm-hmm. which can be challenging but i kind of did both and so My dissertation was about adversarial machine learning, applying it to something called federated learning. Mm. So this is another new term for the audience. So at a high level, you know, federated learning is basically a machine learning framework for privacy preserving algorithms. So machine learning, we know typically it's data going to Mm. a centralized server all the data is hosted in a centralized server usually whenever we're aggregating all this data from different clients so in federated learning let's say you know we have mobile devices cell phones and we want to communicate and collaborate on some kind of machine learning model an example is um google keyboard So if we want all these cell phones to communicate with each other, we obviously don't want the data to be shared across different devices. So what they do is in federated learning, the server does not host data. What it's doing is it's hosting a machine learning model. Mm. So this machine learning model is basically communicated to all these different clients for cell phones. And then each cell phone basically trains the model on its own local device. So, I mean, we have something like App Store on our phone or Google Play Store for Android. So that's an example. And we have all these different apps, right? Mm -hmm. And all these apps have their own data associated with it. So imagine there's some kind of system process with machine learning. And what this system process is doing is getting data from the phone in terms of how you train the model. It does not share, it does not share any of this data. So it's sharing the machine learning model. So in machine learning, we know changes happen based on the data we give it, right? Because it's learning different things. And all these cell phones basically communicate to the server and the server basically aggregates all this information into its own machine learning model. And that's really how federated learning works is it's collaborating across devices or data sets without sharing the data itself. Okay. And so okay. my dissertation was basically looking at adversarial machine learning attacks on this framework. Okay, very in-depth. Uh... Okay. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Actually, yeah. I, I, you know, like yeah. it, it, give, it brings me back to my like studies and machine learning engineering and, and so on. Like uh, a few years ago, like I really this was a nice deep dive, actually. Yeah, I mean, so hopefully now the audience understands what it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah I that's hope the they goal. do. <laughs> but our audience is pretty technical, so I hope they do. 
And uh, I think that's the last question that we always ask uh, our guests. So if you, because you said it's good, great to watch videos, uh, you know, to learn about machine yeah. learning, but do you have any book recommendation as well? Uh, I think so in terms of books, there are a lot of them, right? Um, hmm. In terms of machine learning. So there's one book hands on uh, with Keras and TensorFlow. Okay. So it's like hands-on machine learning with mm -hmm. scikit-learn, Keras, and TensorFlow, I believe. If you search up yeah. hands-on machine learning, you'll see oh, it. It's by a French, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's actually the textbook I'm using for the okay. class I'm teaching. Mm. But it's really good because it has coding examples for all these machine learning models. And it teaches you the basics of machine learning kind of from the beginning to all the way to deep learning. Um, so you go over Python, you go over scikit-learn or sklearn, mm. you go over TensorFlow, you go over generative adversarial networks. So if you've seen of um, the face generator tool on the website mm -hmm. where you can generate AI faces, so mm. it goes over that. So it's a really good overview of machine learning. And then in terms of cybersecurity, I don't think there are any books that I recommend in terms of getting the skills specifically, because with cybersecurity, it's very hands-on, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, you have to do it. Um, sometimes practice. people do, yeah, practice. Sometimes people do CTFs if they're interested in that, right? You could do a CTF. It doesn't mimic the real world, but at least it teaches you some concepts. And that's good for students to get a hands-on overview of that. And just networking with the community is my other advice, because maybe someone at a meetup will know more and they'll be able to refer you to something. That's a great advice. I think we hear that really from a lot of people about the power of networking in cybersecurity. That's something that uh, right. I think it really sh is shared, you know, across the whole uh, community. So great. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience with us. And uh, it was a very informative uh, podcast episode. So I really hope our audience learned a lot uh, from it. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. It was thank a great you so episode. much. Really appreciated having you here. Thank you so much for having me on the show.